uh, two Siegel talks here at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center in Midtown at the Great Graduate Center CUNY. And uh, my name is Frank Henschke and I'm uh, running these talks uh, for four months. Uh, I spoke daily every day of the week uh, with um, uh, over 90 sessions to like 150 artists uh, from 50 countries. And we had a look at uh, what, um, what uh, this uh, pandemic, the situation we are in, um, is uh, how it's infecting us, what it is doing to us and why we have to continue, but also what we have to change uh, in the ways we do things and to find forms that now work as Brecht said, and we always uh, use it as a motto, new times need new forms of theater. And if there's ever a new time, something where we feel things cannot go on as they were, but they have to be a change and we have to be part of it. It is now, and uh, it is important to listen to the voice of artists and uh, now in the fall, we open it up also to producers, uh, curators, uh, thinkers, academics, philosophers, uh, community organizers. And, um, but all of them also, most of the time we feel uh, have a strong artistic side. And with us today, we have a truly significant uh, worker in the big vineyard of theater, Tom Walker. Yesterday he talked that he, I'm a worker in the vineyard of theater. And, um, he is with us is Harlem native uh, Shadi Lithgott, and she's the chief executive officer, the CEO um, of the historic National Black Theater, and it was the nation's first uh, revenue-generating black arts complex and the longest-run theater by a woman of color. She's the daughter of the legendary uh, Dr. Barbara Antier, and uh, many, many, many people do know about her and uh, adore her. Her work and have been deeply uh, affected uh, by it. She was the uh, champion of African American arts and culture, and so she's carrying on a great, a great family uh, tradition. Uh, Shadi serves as the chair of the Coalition of Theaters of Color, an alliance of 52 theaters across New York City, and a very, very important organization whose a significance I hope everybody realizes uh, even uh, more. And now was founded by Ossie Davis and Ruby D in 2004, um, kind of later than one even expects. And um, it was there to combat the systematic inequities in the field and to ensure that theaters of colors are funded and uh, have uh, right ways to, to work. More recently, um, she uh, co-leads uh, a culture at three, a daily call of over 300 cultural leaders from across New York City. Um, she is on the task force of the governor to revive the New York arts. And, um, and uh, she is uh, truly very deeply involved. She's also the advisor on the national board for the arts in changing um, America. Her work has been published in many, many places. You can look it up uh, on the CV and the CV put up in here. And also she created, produced a highly acclaimed musical, A Time to Love. And currently it is in partnership and in development with the great Apollo Theater. So um, Shade, thank you for taking the time to join us. Thanks for having me, Frank. I, yeah. I feel bad for our viewers if they had to sit through that long um, introduction of the things that I just do, because I guess we all just do so much, but um, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you, thank you. Yes, and we also have many international listeners who do not know uh, as much about it um, as perhaps New Yorkers do or we do. And uh, so where are you at the moment? I am in Harlem. Um, uh, New York City uh, in my co, uh, what, what do they call them, co-work space, which is also my home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you're there with your son and, uh, and yeah. your, your family, your Austrian husband, as you said, and, um, <laughs> and, um, and so how are you doing? You know, that question has become such a loaded question in these times, um, and I try to lean into really feeling like, how am I? I feel like in this moment, um, I'm good, I'm slightly tired and overwhelmed. Um, and the tired is more of a like a soul fatigue, but, um, but I'm good and I'm here and I am, um, and I am, I feel very privileged to be here. So that's how I am. How are you? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's the same. It's, um... 
a marathon in a way um, we are running um, and um, and sometimes one feels so one doesn't move along one uh, doesn't do enough uh, always something is missing always something doesn't get done or and um, and I miss I miss uh, people in the room I miss hearing you know people voices seeing them the energy they bring it's very hard for me I'm a work team worker also you know to do things um, on one's own and um, yeah and the chatter of um, you know an opening night or um, I know it's the fall this is when everything is supposed to be opening yeah. I think that's another bit of the heaviness um, and when you say it's a marathon I, I, I like to say it's a sprinting marathon so yeah it's true, yeah, because also we do a lot, even though I feel I don't, don't get anything done compared to normally. So tell us a bit about your daily work. What, how does it look like? You are you're running one of the great important institutions in New York, the National Black Theater. How does your day look like? Well, um, so <laughs> I, we always laugh at the end of the day, some of me and my team on our last meeting, we just like to capture how many Zooms we've been on in a day and yesterday at the end of my day i had i had had 13 zoom calls um and so um and today i believe this is my third or my fourth and it's you know noon uh eastern standard time my day is a mixture of um creative administrative and um social disruption, right? Um, I National Black Theater, which is located in Harlem, is in the midst of a huge transformation as we're redeveloping our property. So there's a part of my day that's like, you know, a lot of real estate and design and um, uh, just uh, really centered around the redevelopment. There's a part of my day that very much is dealing with the evolution of our programming. Like I said, it's the fall. So we just launched our 52nd season um, with a micro commission series called Unbossed and Unbought, Reclaiming Our Vote, really looking at the um, legacy of Shirley Chisholm and Black women and their, vo their voice tied to the power of our vote. And so we commissioned seven incredibly amazing multidisciplinary self-identified black women and they have created new work around this subject matter um so kind of in the weeds of all of that and the rest of our season and then the other part of me is that every day at 3 p.m i find myself here co-leading with um lucy sexton from new yorkers for culture and art and taryn sacramone from the queen's theater uh culture at three which is a daily uh, call that brings nonprofit art leaders from around New York um, to one place every day to share um, questions, concerns, how we're navigating this time, to lean on each other as resources, um, and to find sustainable ways to move forward. So my day is a mixed bag of lots of different um, things. Yeah, yeah, and so then, then you have also the kid with you. You know, that's quite, a, quite, a, quite incredible, incredible um, time. So, what's on the minds of the people who are with you on the calls? What's what? What do you guys talk about? Well, the beautiful thing about Culture at Three is it's this completely democrat, completely democratic space. So we literally talk about whatever is on the minds of folks um, in the moment. So. You know, it's everything from federal advocacy around save our stages and help helping to inform what that bill looks like from the um, from a federal government standpoint, all the way down to how to fill out a forgiveness application for PPP. Um, we have different working groups that really encompass the deep work that the call tries to champion so we have an anti-racism working group a communications race uh communications working group a reopening working group all the way through to um state a city and federal advocacy so it kind of always shifts and changes right now a hot topic are rent parties you know this uh real need to look at um 
how people are affording the rent of their organizations. They can't be in them, they can't activate them, but their rent is due. And some for some organizations, that's the difference um, of being in business and not being in business. So we're, you know, the late of late, the calls have been about um, finding creative ways to fundraise. And I would say also um, there's a lot of new legislation being um, introduced to the city council around supporting the arts, um, uh, performing arts in particular. We were the, you know, first to close, last to reopen um, with the expectation that we would still create programming all the way through. It's been a really obviously challenging road. So looking at policy to help you know, and support our industries in ways that, you know, our city council and our local governments can be um, helpful, uh, you know, helping to create a way forward for us to do our work. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the, some of the stuff we talk about. Mm. So, so like the legendary rent parties and that great depression of people, people invited friends to come over for a drink in their apartment. So the theaters are doing it? Yeah. Live yeah. events, people yeah. come yeah. in? Over, but over Zoom, so you know, you get a DJ and um, or several DJs. You invite folks. Uh, you engage your community, and other people can host the Zoom rent parties on their platforms. And really, it's a time for artists to express themselves, to listen to music, to have a drink, and to donate towards a lot of very meaningful and needy um, organizations that are looking to find a way forward to sustain themselves through this uncertain time. Um, that's the one thing that like gives me so much energy in these very long days of how we're leaning into each other, how we're listening differently, and how we're showing up to support each other. Um, I feel like that is always the spirit of the artist, but it may not be the implementation of our industry. And seeing that gap close through COVID has been really inspiring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those, uh, maybe at the end you let us know, you know, on the website where one maybe where one where they are listed, where one can find it, and perhaps people might um, and want to join. Um, your work um, also, as you described in the day, also has a kind of the organizing part or political part to it, um, and often it is overlooked. Do you feel we we are in a moment where this has to be taken more serious than before? A hundred percent. I, I could like, you know, NBT has always been a civic minded organization. We believe in the power of transformative narratives to affect policy and cultural shifts and change. We know that what we do is a superpower, right? To be able to tell people's stories really is a gateway to help shift and change people's hearts and minds. So we, we have always known that as an artist. What I didn't fully ever understand is the degree by which partnership with our local and state and federal government is crucial in the blueprint of our own sustainability. And no one knows our needs better than us, right? So artists have to be at the table regardless of crisis or not. And I never until this moment understood how imperative our voice is at the table. And the table is not a table that like we readily want to be at, you know, like there's but so many hours in the day. That table is not necessarily a table we're always openly invited to, but our voice as we shape the way and the values and the environment, the ecosystem by which we live needs artists. And so I kind of started taking on all of this by accident. I showed up like everyone else, scared, uncertain. And what I began to see as we all navigated COVID and all of the uprisings together is that the artist's voice is more important than ever. And that the powers that be, whatever that is, whatever those systems are, are not informed, 
are not clearly informed by the work we actually do. So the perception of the work that we do is very different than many of our organizations and our uh, institutions and theaters. And that we can't expect our government to show up for us if we are not showing up to lead um, and direct them in the in the direction of our needs and wants. And, um, and so I kind of stepped into something and I can't shake it, if you will, you know, I can't quit it because it's just so, so, so very important and it's very crucial at this time specifically. Mm. Yeah, I remember I, I once saw a graffiti and it said, you know, art speaks, but what does it say? Um, what does art have to, has to say in the moment? Well, what does art have to say in any moment, right? Uh, art is the articulation of the heartbeat of a people and of a time, right? For me, I'm a very visual person. I went to school for, I went to school for so many things that like, I just, they didn't stick. And finally, I um, majored in art history at NYU. And for the first time, the world made sense. So you know, that's the gift of the artist to make sense of the craziness of our times, to be able to translate it in a way that people can feel seen, heard, and ultimately much more sacred in the, in the space that they occupy. So for me, the artist's role now is to be able to digest and translate these times and to offer us something that we ourselves did not know we even needed, but is the medicine of how we recover and move forward. Um, you know, NBT's kind of shifted into a space of, you know, our, our pedagogy is steeped in a healing modality for Yeah, I think we lost her for a moment, at least I our did. Artist. <laughs> Oh, am I back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's built into our programming, but really now in this moment, Frank, what we've pivoted towards is how to be better active listeners and deeper listeners, because we find a lot of our activism or our artivism, it comes from a space of listening. And now more than ever, because these are unprecedented times, the listening is informing the art um, in a profound way. Um, so yeah, how are you experiencing that at the Mark Siegel Center? Well, um, <clears throat> we are our building is closed, um, the Graded Center, you know, where we do our events. Normally, we do um, during the semesters one event a week. Um, whether it's the readings, the discussions, symposia, or, or talks, you know, also on academics that we bridge academia and professionally, though it's closed. It actually was barricaded till a month ago uh, with wood, and uh, as it looked like, uh, <clears throat> though no looters get in. And uh, there was a funny graffiti I saw in New York. It said, um, um, no looting except uh, equity companies, you know, <laughs> we're allowed, so uh, that is not legal. So uh, anyway, so I don't know, so it's, it's hard for us and we defend, so we started the, <clears throat> these uh, Siegel talks as a way to also understand, cre create meaning and hear from all places around the world, also globally. Most probably it's like one of the, the only profession now that is through these talks, but like theater, how it, it's been experienced this time of Corona in, a, in an archiving way like archiving in the moment and yeah. um, so it's hard and we do not really know where it will go we lost our funding um, and we are a small place and uh, you know and um, there are more significant artists are starving now and companies so we are not for good reasons at the center you know of, <clears throat> of development and we are thinking where should we go now so we'd like to get your advice and talk to you maybe a bit at, at the end so it's um it's hard you're you're listening as you say um is it towards community or is it towards artists or is it towards audiences that new listening, where, where does it take place? So it's really a great question. I think for black people specifically, our intersectionality is our humanity. And like so many indigenous African cultures, there is no difference between like spirit, 
religion, culture. And so I would just say the deep listening is in all of those places because all of those places to our to us are community. So we always say National Black Theater is a community theater with a capital C. And our audience really is our artists, our physical audience. It is our artists. Um, and so and it's this ecosystem that continues to feed each other. So I would say like our investments are being made deeply into artists, particularly during this period of time. So like we're doubling down on all of our residency programs to create more opportunity and more pipelines to disrupt, um, you know, the standard practice narratives and um, the standard practice stories told in the field. So more than diversifying the field, I'm less interested in diversifying the field as I am in disrupt disrupting the field from a space of racial justice and equity. Um, so we're doubling down there because we know our artists are the hardest hit by this. You know, it's one thing to, yes, we have brick and mortar, but we know that the ecosystem by which artists exist and are able to create um, this, this kind of, this, the trauma of this moment affects them in a very specific and unique way um, that is much more invisible than us that have platforms in this way, right? So we are, um, we're listening deeply to the needs of our artists community. Um, and then, you know, National Black Theater in so many ways, because we're a community with a capital C, a part of our work is service, right? We see ourselves, our, our sacred duty as art makers, as service workers for Harlem community. And to your point, Frank, if there are silver linings to this moment that we're in you know we do our talks as well we do our shows we have a 99 seat black box theater but now when we do one of our artist talks or now when we do our commissions you know thousands of people from around the world get to view it and so we're looking at accessibility in a different way and the concerns of a global community an intersectional community in a very nuanced way and that part has been very exciting for the theaters specifically we too are still closed um um, but we're also transitioning out of our space so for us our audience and our community is a is one and we're listening deeply to all of it really and the field right that's the advocacy piece coalitions of theaters of color you know 52 organizations across all five boroughs those those spaces and those communities that those theaters and cultural spaces serve have been literally the hardest hit by COVID in a city that has been the hardest hit in the country by COVID. So there is a very unique, specific and timely need that our communities uniquely have right now. And we're listening to that too. Um, yeah. Mm, yeah. So the Black Lives Matter and the uh, George Floyd killings, do you feel something changed or is it uh, a, a continuation of earlier what was there perhaps a bit more exposed or do you feel from looking back at the work of the National Black Theater, also your mother's work, do you feel this is a moment that is different? That's a good question. I don't know if it's different. History repeats itself. This year is very similar to 1968, the year my mom founded the National Black Theater. There was a pandemic. There was uh, uh, uprisings, racial uprisings. There was, you know, uh, many assassinations of beloved leaders. And so I don't know if it's different. I think though, in this moment in time, there's always new opportunities to listen differently. And I can see some of that happening. Um, I wrestle with these moments being so defined as catalytic because much of the conversation are conversations that have happened for generations. So I'm always listening for what's new, what's the shift um, and NBT is one of those spaces, right? Like while 
this is a moment of reckoning for our country and a new generation is introduced to the movement of black lives and you know i'm inspired by the diversity of folks in the streets chanting black lives matter and yet i i also wonder where is the investment in black lives and black lives must map living the live the lived experience of black lives must be as important if not more or the most important than the memorial memorializing of lives we've lost that the lives we've lost is tragic and traumatic but it can't be a destination and 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 nbt's opportunity and challenge is to invite people in to building institutions and arts that are reflective of the quality of our lives mattering as opposed to the dismantling and the calling out of systems that must change. And so for me, that feels new and that feels inspired and must um, stay at the forefront. I'm also very concerned in this moment that people see it as a, mo a moment and not a continuation of a movement. We stand on the shoulders of so many ancestors that have created the pathway for us to be able to have these conversations. And again, we have a sacred obligation to be able to move the conversation through actionable steps forward. So what are we going to do? Not just what are we going to say? Um, and so for me, those are the things I'm looking at for it to be different. I'm looking for, you know, entrenched conversations around sharing power, not just racial equity. I think that our lives mattering is the floor, it's not the ceiling. And there's too many conversations around the floor. And I want for my people, my community, my theater, I want for artists, I want for America and the world to understand that all of our humanity is intertwined with one another. And if there's any community that is not well, none of us can be well. And these protests and these rebellions will continue, you know, day in and day out if we don't have a reckoning around our shared humanity. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're developing all the seven pieces, you know, you, you talked about. Um, six pieces. So, oh, six pieces. Yeah. So tell us a bit, how is that reflected in the work or what are you looking, is it, does it has a different political tone in it or a community? What are you detecting? Is there, or tell us a bit about maybe also the artists involved. So what's, yeah. what do you? Um, so. Uh, you can go to our website to see all of the different commissions. We've released three so far. Lady Dane was our first uh, commission. She did an incredible um, spoken word dance piece around uh, the history of, um, of um, suffragettes and how Black women in specifically were used and um, removed from the from that movement um so she in her in her commission i want to say is course correcting through her lived experience um the black woman's um experience the black woman's uh, uh um embodied embodiment of where we are and how we got here um and the importance of the vote. She says in that piece, voting as harm reduction, right? Vote as harm reduction, which I love, right? This idea that the vote is essential. It's not gonna change everything overnight. It's not going to make, you know, the, 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 the trauma and the terror of our experience in the country go away. It isn't a salve, but it is a important step in harm reduction. And so 
that was the first commission, which is an incredibly beautiful piece. You can see it on our um, website and our YouTube channel. Um, and then every week we're releasing a new video leading up to the election. Uh, and Guzzi, who shared this platform with uh, our mm -hmm. artistic director, Jonathan McCrory, months ago at one of the Seagull Talks, she is a commissioned artist and her take on it, I don't want to say too much about it because we haven't released it, but hers is really a check-in on Black women. She's just like, how are we doing? You know, she's concerned in her piece about the soul of our people. Um, and that if we're not, if we're not looking at our mental and spiritual health, how can we show up for the movement if we can't even show up for ourselves? So it's a check-in, you know, and that's her take on civic engagement. Can't be civically engaged if you're not, if you're disengaged with yourself. So yeah, they're all very different. Um, but they're all very powerful and speak again to the intersectionality of the experience of Black folks in this country and the, and the diaspora. Hmm. Um, and, and I will say that, you know, we partnered with Michelle Obama's When We All Vote. So again, that's kind of the pedagogy of the National Black Theater, right? It is asking artists to be unapologetic and use radical imagination to create the future where black people exist now, right? And we don't ask them to be political. We don't ask them to have an agenda. We ask them to create from a soul filled place. And you know, the space that is the National Black Theater, we always say sans the white gaze. And that for some people is a journey to even get there. Um, but create and what National Black Theater does because of what our mission and our commitment to community is, is we tease out the social impact, social justice themes of what is on the minds and hearts of our artists and turn it into a conversation between artists who my mother referred to as liberators and an audience that are untapped activists so that they can have a conversation and actively engage, be active citizens in their own community. So that's what the series really is looking to do. Um, again, we don't put that on the artists. We partner with um, civic organizations and we create that dialogue. Um, and in this day and age, we offer it up on these digital platforms. So yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, free. it's free. Yeah, it's free. Um, which is completely unsustainable. And I think that that's something that gets lost in the pivot. I, I, people are like, you know, artists pivot so well. I'm like, yeah, but we keep continue pivoting and pivoting and pivoting until we pivot off of a cliff. So yes, our series is free. Um, there is no paywall, but I do wanna say um, shooting this work in the way that so many of us have to do now is as expensive um, as producing shows with yeah, yeah. no real kind of clear destination for how to create revenue. And as much as we do this, because this is a part of like the zeitgeist of how we live and what's important to us, it is also unsustainable. So some of the work that I do on the governor's task force um, is to really help folks along with the other members help folks to understand that art and organ and institutions need a roadmap forward we know we make things look wonderfully easy and creative but this is a hard road and some certainty that we will be able to reopen um, is important for people to be able to survive this moment yeah yeah that's, that's really important. You know, do you have my uh, sound on? I hear a little double feed at the moment, if you, uh, but maybe it's just me. Um, so um, the way you produce your work now at the moment, yeah, is it a new way of producing, or do you feel we have always worked that way, or do you feel something new is coming up in the way you put these things together? Is that different? So I always say that the, there's a blueprint. The blueprint hasn't changed, right? Our mission, our values, 
uh, the kind of artists that we are committed to, um, that hasn't shifted so much. But our approach absolutely has um, in a lot of glorious ways and in a lot of ways that are, you know, really challenging. I think the glorious part of it is that we're looking at accessibility in a much more nuanced, entrenched way, which I think as an industry is is imperative and specifically um, for our organization is something we've always championed, but really doing that in a different way. Um, also, I would say the opportunity in this moment to be a 50 year old startup, 52 year old startup, there's a lot of alchemy for so many of our organizations between the uprisings and between COVID to really look at the building blocks of our organizations from a space of anti-racism all the way through like making sure that there's a digital component to our programming. That said, you know, um, creating programming that's dynamic and has the same artistic rigor for a platform that isn't so familiar to us. We're learning on the, you know, day to day on the job of how to make dynamic work um, on this platform. That's been a challenge, um, but it's also had a lot of opportunities because like I said before, our audience is now global in a way that it wasn't uh, prior to COVID. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's an incredible change. So we are experiencing it. We sometimes have listeners from twenty five countries. You know, five or ten thousand people on one uh, talk. Um, it's un, un it was not imaginable even for us um, um, before. And I would like to applaud you. You know, as you said, as a ninety nine seat theater with you know that has to fight for survive. The work you guys do, um, the research, uh, the experiments compared to the big. Broadway theaters where New York is normally identified with, you know, in America and in the world, you know, it is also the dominating, you know, system of a commercial theater where it is about uh, making money, an industry that made billions, you know, and they are not doing the work you're doing now, they are not supporting in the way you were doing it now, and it does show now, you know, where um, theater in a <clears throat> really is, or the heart of it, or the soul, and in your contribution is, is of um, such um, such significance, and um, yeah, I wonder the fifty two theaters, uh, the alliance you also you know had. Will, can, will, can, will, I, huh? can I just say something to that too? Yeah. And and what I hope for this moment, the kind of work that National Black Theater does, and what we value is transformative experiences, and if there's any kind of lesson to be able to feed out to the field is that being committed to transformative, because that's what art does. It is a catalytic form of energy sharing. So to be in the business of transformation is way more sustainable than the transactional business of theater. And if anything can be like relayed it is that if we are not here to transform our spaces, to transform our communities and to constantly be digging deep within ourselves to figure out the nuance of sustainability, the nuance of healing, the nuance of our responsibility as the voices and the stewards of our planets because we know transformative stories change the world. And if you can't hear it and see it, you can't be it. So we as artists and institutions and legacy holders have that absolute call to action in this moment to support the ecosystem that is our humanity to be more just, to be more sustainable, and at the end of the day to be more connected. And that's transformation. And I hope that gets imparted in all of what we're traversing. Yeah. Yeah, that's, an, that's a very important uh, reminder and a statement that this is a transformational moment. It's a chance, it's hard, but that ultimately also art or real art or the effect of art uh, can be that more energy will shine out and put in and helps to transform um, and make us, you know, comfortable with the times we live in and give meaning and also anticipate a bit 
the future that's coming and say, it will be fine, it is good. You know, it's a failure, Edouard Glison, I often say it, a great writer and thinker who also taught the Grad Center from the Caribbean, he said, it was a, it's a failure of imagination, the mm -hmm. racism that people cannot imagine living next door, you know, to people from around the world, that people cannot imagine, you know, um, having, you know, gay or lesbian couples in their school or whatever, or a teacher like this. It's, and he say, no, it's, you know, just listen, look at their story, it's not, you know. And um, so that's, a, there is a, a significant power and I think it has to be addressed. It's a big call and it might also go wrong as experiments, but we have to try it, we have to do it. This is the time um, yeah. where it's potentially yeah. needed. I agree. Yeah, and that there is all of this, you know, you cannot have catalytic shifts without disruption. So let us find a new way to look at the disruption of the mo this moment. You know, when people are like, but it's so uncomfortable. My mother used to always say, have a love affair with discomfort because on the other side of discomfort is the birth of, you know, new possibilities. You can't create a diamond without incredible amount of friction, right? So we need to lean into the moment. We, we, we have to stop trying to reach back to something that was normal or reach back to something that was familiar. There's no going back. This, there is no, you know, th there was no sustainability. There might have been comfort, but comfort is also very dangerous. There's no innovation in comfort. And so this this moment is like a big bang and there's only a way forward and that and so the leaning in to like this is going to be uncomfortable this is not asking me to show up in my in my privilege or my comfortability this is asking me can i have a love affair with this discomfort can I not only digest, but interrogate what's being placed in front of me? And it's through the questioning that we will come to some kind of answers and solutions, but those aren't like, you know, we did not, we never achieved anything without great risk, great failure and great friction. And so really just recontextualizing this moment as much as we can through the pain and the heartache and the real experiences that we're living through, which are not to be kind of marginalized or made small of. These are trying times that require all of us like the fullness of us to show up. Um, but the fullness of us has to show up, the good, the bad, and the uh, uncomfortable, and stay committed to getting to the other side together. Mm -hmm. um, those 52 theaters of color, that collision you're also um, so deeply involved in, do, will some close? How, how, how dangerous is the moment for, this, for these theaters? I think it's a dangerous moment for all theaters, to be very honest. I think that I try not to traffic in the trauma story um, of will they close, they're going to close, um, because that often gets taken as the headline. And I don't feel like anything sustainable is built on fear, which is what we're seeing played out in our country right now. But the, tr and the truth of the matter is, this is a tr extremely trying time. Um, and in particular for the CTC, their BIPOC cultural spaces, most of which that are theaters. So you're already dealing with a population that has systemically been marginalized and left out of the, uh, uh, the mainstream, um, um, uh, uh, pathways of, of revenue, of development, you know, these are some of the, some of the smaller institutions in our five boroughs. So by proxy of all of those things are the most, can be some of the most fragile institutions. Um, and so this is really hard. I will also say, you know, so much about theaters of color differently than predominantly a PWT um, 
organizations, predominantly white theaters, is that built into our mission is a connectivity to community. So, so many of our CTC theaters are actually human service organizations. You know, they're the, they are the connectivity of student to, to school. They are the connectivity of a bilingual house where a parent only speaks Spanish and the child speaks English, but the art form brings them together. We are a, a sustainable web of community within our specific locations. And so our work is more needed in some regards than ever. And yet there's less resources. Um, it was a huge win and I do wanna shout the city council of New York out and the city of New York out. You know, um, New York City, this last budget season where people were, um, were not uh, where New York City was facing a $9 billion um, gap in its budget um, and experienced deep cuts across the boards. You know, the activism and the advocacy of, of this moment and this movement for coalitions of theaters of color, which is a city council initiative. Um, you know, um, uh, council member Jimmy Van Bramer and majority leader L Lori Cumbo went to the mat for these theaters. Jimmy was doing great work. We, we gave him an award from the Siegel Center and uh, he was so him. Yeah, it's uh, someone we all should support. And yeah, uh, he was so brave in the in the conversations around funding for coalitions of theaters of color. And you know, thankfully, we were um, the, one of the only cultural initiatives that didn't receive a cut because the what Jimmy and what um, Lori Cumbo and Jimmy Van Bramer acutely knew with the rest of the council was this is not the time to you know to 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 cut communities that are the most affected by the virus and are doing some of the most important work in our communities. So, yeah. Mm. You, you did, if I may ask, I mean, you did mention your mother a couple of times, the time also when she founded um, the uh, NBT. So it, tell us a bit about her. Tell her what, what, why did she do it? How did she inspire you? And what, tell us a bit about her. Oh, there's not enough time in the day. Yeah. <laughs> but um, my mom, uh, Dr. Barbara Antier, was a maverick visionary black woman who was unstoppable. She um, was a classically trained dancer who hurt her knee very early on in her very successful career and found theater as a result. Um, she was kind of a foremother of the Black Arts Movement. She started something called um, a group theater workshop, which turned into the Negro Ensemble Company with Robert Hooks and Douglas Turner Ward. Um, and that was during the 60s. Her, her, her sister, her older sister, who was one of her best friends, was um, a, one, a, was a Black Panther and one of the uh, um, architects of the Panthers free breakfast program um, on the West Coast. And so her life literally collided within the family structure, art and activism. And in 19, in the mid 1960s, she began to understand that the work of the black artists in particular had a deeper and um, more specific calling, which was the foundation of the black arts movement. And so um, in 1968, after the founding of the NEC, she knew acutely that representation was important, but it representation wasn't transformation. And so in 1968, you know, after that incredibly incredible calling of Dr. King's last speech before he was assassinated that says invest and build black institutions. She moved her whole family up to Harlem and she founded the National Black Theater. A little known fact about my mom, when she first went to college, she was 15 years old and she was a biology major. So I think a big part of the way she thought about the world, and you have said this um, a few times, Frank, is as this incredible experiment 
Um, and it's okay to fail an experiment as long as you really put your hypothesis out and do everything to prove what is and what's not. And for her, she wanted to imbue black culture with a dignity that didn't exist on this continent. And so, so much of the work that she um, developed, which was a unique way of working blackly was formulated by uh, tracing our ancestry back to Africa and, under, and being able to infuse in her art form uh, the majesty of who we actually are, as opposed to the story that we learn about ourselves in school. And so she called her first company of actors Liberators, and she was setting out to to extinguish the oppressive story, not in our country, right? It wasn't white dominated focus, but to extinguish the conversation of oppression within ourselves. Because if each of us could be liberated souls, then whatever it is that we set our mind to, we can build the future now for the liberation of black people. And so that's what she was acutely focused on, building the future now for the liberation of black people. And she used theater as a vehicle by which to do it, but she wasn't limited to that. She was amazing. Not a good cook though. Not a good cook, so yeah, yeah. You can't do, can't do everything. You have to focus your energies um, on, um, on, uh, on what to do. So wh what do you think would she do what you do now? Would she do something different? Um, would she, what, what do you think she would go for in a moment like this, with the elections coming up, with the Black Lives Matter movement, with the, the theaters you know, in, in such uh, uh, danger and all of it? So I don't think she would do what I do. Um, she was way more visionary in a lot of ways um, and before her time. Um, Ma, but I, what I will say is, you know, when I took over as the CEO of MBT, when she passed away in 2008, I struggled um, because she had such big shoes to fill. And, you know, she saw the world very specifically and that the call to action was very specific. A part of that kept MBT in a very specific space that one could perceive as small because she was just disinterested in the white gaze, the white lens. She was disinterested by playing by the rules of a game that was built to keep folks like us marginalized and without power. And so she built a Mecca and that Mecca for, I would say 35, 40 years was in a bubble that all it did was pour all of its resources into healing black folks through the arts, right? For me, my mother was my best friend. So I could see where she wanted to go. And I could also see where the vision from a public facing standpoint was limited based on her experience of the world and the hurt and the trauma that she was constantly trying to process. And so when she passed away, you know, one of her dear friends was Maya Angelou and Maya wrote the eulogy, one of the eulogies for her funeral. And it was really this incredibly beautiful piece that said like, Barbara Antier, no one did it like her, no one could do it, no one should try. And here I am like her daughter, you know, venturing into this space and so, for the first five years, I would say, of my tenure at NBT, I struggled because I was not my mother and I wasn't even a good version. I was never a good actress, so I wasn't even a good version of acting like her. Um, and it wasn't until uh, Auntie Maya passed away, I revisited her words and they were actually the key to my own liberation, that instead of this imposter syndrome that I was trying so hard to fulfill, that there was, that each of us have acute, unique gifts that will change and can change the world. And so I started to look at my role at NBT as just that, 
my mom did what she did. She built what she built and no one can do it better than her. But what can I do? What can Jonathan McCrory do? What can we uniquely bring to the legacy of NBT? And for us, that was translating the work into a brand, translating the work into a national stage by which we can be in service to more artists and more community based on the absolute building blocks and blueprints that Dr. Tier built. So we, we look very different, but we're very much the same. We are rooted in the same things NBT has always been rooted in, but we're a little bit taller, if you will, because we stand on the shoulders of such mighty ancestors, Dr. Tier being obviously first and foremost. So um, yeah. And, and I will say lastly to that point, you know, one of my mother's dearest friends and, and um, uh, who she danced for one of her first dance companies was Alvin Ailey. And so, you know, Alvin and my mother struggled as founders with the same kind of thing. They were so close to the work, the work was so sacred. And sometimes it takes the next generation to be able to honor what these maverick visionaries have created and from a different purview be able to amplify it and so that's what i hope i can and do bring to the next chapter of nbt 2.0 just an amplification of all the incredible liberators and dr tears mission and vision and work yeah and now you are changing as you said the, the building the structure um what what would be also something if you say if, I, if you could do and you had more resources is there something we say this is actually i feel that's what is needed that's what i do in a smaller way but in a bigger one is there um something that you have in mind i think the frontier that my mother was always transfixed by and through this experience of COVID is essential is the innovation of technology. So MBT behind the scenes is really investing in new media technologies, new ways to tell our stories, you know, with virtual reality and augmented reality, people think, oh, that's a computer thing or that's not real. The truth of the matter is, you know, reality is perception. And, you know, we are so deeply committed to the liberation of black people and the healing of our communities that we know through innovative technologies, we can strike that vibration of soul. We can turn it up even louder. And so for me, where I see NBT moving into the future really is looking at new media in a way that brings the innovation of technology to the forefront. My mother always wanted to create a three-dimensional hemispheric theater that takes visitors on uh, 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 the journey of the African story um, brought here to America from our perspective. And so I'm really looking at those kinds of investments now, um, how to tell our stories more impactfully and how to transcend this mechanism into something that transforms our lives. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that, that is quite inspiring. And I think also of significance, you know, the virtual reality uh, dome projections. And, uh, and it's interesting also, um, uh, Ralph Pena was the Mayi theater said, I'm, I'm investing a lot to have my small theater kind of a virtual TV so that I can do anything I want or we yeah. want in my community. Because yeah. he says, now we have, you know, listeners and viewers from around the world, but we still want to do theater. But I think that thing he feels um, he has to invest in, as many also say, we have to go in the parks and the streets, we have to go outside and also then bring people back inside and the technology. So really uh, something is happening, something already has changed and we are slowly maybe coming to terms with it. You know, we are trying to do an, uh, uh, in the summer of 2022, a three week, New York International Festival of the Arts. There was one, a very, very big one, Marty Siegel put together and Joe Melillo worked with him uh, at the time. And I think we, we try to create uh, something. The Avignon Festival, the big one, was founded after World War II um, in 47, when there was really a long time of a city not having open theaters, not having freedom of speech. And so the big idea is, you know, to 
invite all theaters, you know, to participate, some of it curators, so all the theaters of color you work with in all the five boroughs, but also to go to the parks and parking lots, uh, lots of site specific work. So I want you to invite also, you know, to, to be part of it, you know, and to, to think uh, of that, how can we celebrate life again and the change and, uh, and the arts and perhaps in a different way, I think it's wrong uh, what something that we know that Broadway theaters are asking for subsidies that they can go on, you know, and charge, you know, $150, $200 for, I love it, and it's great work and fantastic actors and it's performed so much and that the city is actually identified with theater and the arts through Broadway. But also it has been perhaps more, as you said, the transactional part of it in the of the sugar industry you know the sugar drinks instead of the good tea you know you can also have both drinks and i think we have to have to um find ways to transform this and so i would like you you know also to to, to be part of it in the very beginning of it and we also hope that some international people will help but um what you what you talk about i think is so so um, significant we have to you know in, include include um, the city the audience and look new at uh, our community and also learn from what you said, you know, have said, you said that our communities have always been at the center. And it is true, it's a very big difference yeah. than the theater where people are looked at as, you know, ticket buyers, like politicians and people are voters, uh, companies that they are customers, you know, where, well, theater of color looks always have done that. Say we are a place of community. And, 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 and that is sustainability, right? Looking at the world through a holistic lens where there is no separation. That is the seat of all of our humanity. And so, you know, uh, in these moments where we can find more deeply human ways to connect. And that's why technology can be important because even though there is this barrier. I think that there are really innovative ways to 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 dive deeper in our into our humanity with what the situation that we are been handed. And so, I hope that that's what comes out of this. Um, so much of this pace, as you've said, as, is a marathon. Um, what I really am in meditation with constantly is how to make this moment that has in almost every way sought to dehumanize us um, through the, you know, through the lens of racial justice, but also through these very confined boxes that don't actually even acknowledge our full humanity. How do we infuse that? You know, is it, you know, I make at the end of every week, my um, staff call, we do favorite frames. We start every staff meeting. What's the favorite frames of the week so we can frame the goodness? You know, on Wednesdays now at Culture at Three, it's Wellness Wednesday, and we implore everybody to share the mechanisms by which they tap into their own humanity and tap into their own, you know, wellness. We start Culture at Three on Wednesdays with a piece of art to remind us why we do what we do. And so, um, I, I'm very fascinated by the festival you've described, and I'm very much wanting to center, you know, our humanity in all of the conversations we're having, because that's how we'll get through it. Everything else is unsustainable, really and truly. This pace is unsustainable. What's being asked of us is unsustainable. And if we do not have moments wo woven in to our obligation that affirm who we are as holistic human beings with spirit and ritual and love, we don't have anything, truly. Yeah, no, I think this is a a really significant uh, reminder and not perhaps as obvious, you know, to us that it's also our bodies are connected in our own lives, our own well-being is essential, you know, in the way like in the airplanes when they say, you know, you put the mask on and you put it on your kid, you know, so you also, we have to take care of ourselves in order to also, you know, function and this is something significant that also art uh, in a way teaches us hopefully and, um, and uh, also, you know, from the laundromat project that we talked to, you know, and when, when um, um, Kimi said, you know, we always were running and doing this and we didn't even ask, how are you? 
mm -hmm. to people who work with us. You know, yeah. how could that be? And they say, what's well, the big change also? And we say, yeah, how are you? Yeah. You know, how do you feel? And that's also we have to ask ourselves, you know, so that is a big change next to, I think, yeah, a much stronger political uh, agenda to awareness of the arts and the place of it. And, uh, and that we um, have to, you know, um, um, as your mother would say, you know, to be part of the, the liberators uh, in a way, in a radical revolutionary way. And, um, and I think there is a lot, you know, to, to really learn from that also what, what you guys do. We're slowly coming to an end. What inspires you at the moment? What do you read? Uh, what do you listen to? What are artists you look up to? What do you think, these guys, this has answered, or this helps me to go through? What do you, what, so, what's... I think three things. One, no, no one person has ever been a bigger inspiration or a challenge to my growth than my three-nager son, Thelonious. So this three-year-old boy teaches yeah. me things. He's like three going on 13. Um, constantly teaches me how to be more empathetic, more patient, um, more flexible. Uh, so him. Um, also, I would say, you know, every second Thursday of the month, NBT does a talk series called The Download. And oh, yeah. the, the Download is an opportunity for Jonathan, myself, Nia, and Chelsea, kind of the creative heartbeat of NBT to have real-time conversations about what's happening in community. And I learned so much from the three of them. And I'm so inspired by what comes out of our downloads. And then the last person I would say that I am truly and constantly inspired by literally are like the universe of black women, but in particular, um, uh, Adrienne Marie Brown, um, her championing of pleasure activism and looking at pleasure as a most important part of our activism um, is something that I'm constantly referring to and informing how I articulate the importance of a holistic approach to our work and our activism. Also in that same vein, the NAP ministry on Instagram, also like a, a, a prof, profitizing around the importance of rest as an act of resilience. And so I'm looking in those areas um, to constantly be inspired and to interrogate my own practice and how to be able to show up more fully for the work that I do in the community I serve. Yeah, well, that's that's uh, that's um, quite so. We have to look. We have to look that up and uh, check it in. And again, really, congratulations, you know, on all you do and with your team and your community. Uh, this is the most significant contribution, not only to the life in Harlem, New York, and America, but I think, as you say, in a global view, a holistic view to, to mankind. And it is often important. That's what also theater people do. They're so generous and concerned, you know, um, as you say, to have less hurting or the idea which guides us should be less suffering, you know, that should be a big, big thing. What for politicians and everyone, you know, what, what is of importance now. So um, really, you have all our respect and really thank you for sharing as Zoom call number four, I cannot believe it, you know, and that you're up to 13. That's uh, the most um, I've, I've heard here. So you're such a hard worker and uh, it takes so much discipline and uh, you do it so graciously. And, but it is really of significance and importance and it stands in the symbolic way, in an imaginary way, but also in a real way for so much more, you know, what, what you do and what your, what your theater does. So I hope we stay connected. Yes. And, um, and again, you really thank you. And there's a lot to think about and a lot to learn from and uh, for sharing your experience and your life and also your, your memories. And um, yeah, that is uh, 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 quite, quite something that in that strange way that virus time and all of it brings us in some way closer and uh, together and uh, you listen and know a bit more um, about about each other. Tomorrow we have Saviana Sanescu. She's a playwright from Romania who uh, also taught at NYU, where you went, uh, playwriting. She has been a working uh, playwright, now is back also in Romania, where she tries to 
investigate the transformative power, the revolutionary power also, as she said, of theater and, and the arts, which of course is not easy. Uh, also in, the, in a place like this, with all the complications, are we gonna hear a little update from her? Next week, we're gonna have Florian Malzacker. He's a, a German curator and wrote a book about games. And as you would say, the kind of pleasure, the fun, that is, you know, how maybe theater and performance, you know, have to be, in a way a bit more um, looked at also as, as instructions or based on games and participatory um, um, events. I think it might be an interesting talk. And then Milo Rao will come back and Katya and Carmen, they created a book, Why Theater? Um, so in that they talk to many, many theater artists. Why do we have to do this a great book? Uh, I think it's part of the Wiener Festwochen program also what that is. So here they're going to talk and for our festival and where we also would like to invite you, we also try to put, bring these people then together that they hopefully come here and maybe Florian will bring some of his crew or people he talks about, you know, to create something in neighborhoods all over, as you say, and that's of the significance of the 52 uh, theater coalition there in all five boroughs of New York City. And if you look at the amount of money spent per head in Manhattan on culture, as little as it is compared how it is in Queens or State Island, the Bronx, it's, it, it's shocking how different that is. And that if there is a great audience, it's, it is there. So I think this is also something we really have to change, be open about and work for and enjoy and make a difference. So. Um, hope you all will be able to listen in tomorrow and next week. Thank you again. Thanks to HowlRound for hosting us. Uh, Thea, for, for, Thea for getting up before 9 a.m. in L.A. and, uh, um, and uh, Andy from the Siegel Center and, um, and of course our listeners for taking our time and to listen. But um, as Shade said, listening is now what perhaps we all need to do and to do some real, real listening. So thank you for sharing and thank you for listening and stay also.